I'd like to uh, thank Glenn Nashen and uh, Marisa Rohde and the entire Department of uh, Public uh, Affairs and Relations here at the Jewish General for the very kind invitation to come here and uh, speak to you all tonight. So, as, uh, as Amanda mentioned, uh, I uh, deal a lot with infectious diseases and I find that a lot of my time I'm spending dealing with uh, various infections of the intestine. Uh, as she mentioned, my, I kind of cut my teeth here on the C. diff epidemic that uh, uh, swept through Quebec area hospitals in around 2004, which is when I uh, was here for my residency. And unfortunately, that epidemic has never completely gone away. This is not what a microbiologist is. <laughs> so what I'm here to do uh, tonight is to discuss some of the more common intestinal infections encountered uh, here in Quebec. I hope that you're, you're going to come away with an understanding as to why and how they can affect us. And I'd like to address some questions that are asked frequently by patients uh, that I've uh, come across or that are uh, frequently raised in the media when they're talking about these infections. So tonight's topics are going to include C. difficile, probiotics, the autism gut connection, and listeria. I'd just like to go through a few uh, rules for the talk for tonight. So on pretty much every slide from this point onwards you're going to see, the slide is going to be titled with a question, and I hope that every slide is going to provide an answer to the question that's raised. Uh, any questions you have, I'll be very happy to take them at the end of the presentation. I think we have about a half hour or so uh, to uh, cover these questions. And I would ask that you keep uh, your questions relatively general and non-identifying. Uh, it can be somewhat difficult if you're asking a question regarding your Aunt Betty and it turns out Aunt Betty really didn't want her personal medical information revealed to a whole crowd. So, given that my uh, topic of uh, tonight is bugs in the gut, I thought I should uh, define both terms. So, bugs is uh, slang for any microbes of real or potential importance to human health. This includes bacteria, fungi, viruses, parasites, even prions. But, as you've uh, seen by the topics we're going to be going through tonight, for the most part we're going to be speaking about bacteria uh, for tonight's talk. And the gut really talks about the entire human gastrointestinal system starting at the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, the small and large intestines uh, to the anus. Uh, and again, for tonight, for the most part, we're going to be sticking to uh, the small and large intestines. So with that, we'll uh, move on to C. difficile. This is an electron micrograph picture of C. diff and that big red thing you see is a spore that I'll be uh, speaking a little bit more about. So what is C. difficile, our first question of the night. So it's a spore-forming environmental bacteria that if you go out right now with a shovel and a bucket and you dig a shovel full of dirt, I guarantee you you'll find C. diff somewhere in that, uh, in that shovel full of soil. Because it's found in the soil, not surprisingly, you'll find it in things that grow in the soil or that eat things that are close to the soil. So if you go to Provigo uh, tonight and you take your swab with you, you'll be able to find C. diff in most of the fresh produce that is, uh, that's uh, sort of in direct contact with the ground. You also found, find it in beef. There's been a lot of studies showing that you can at least detect C. diff in ground beef that's sold in everyday uh, grocery stores. This is not meant to freak you out. Very clearly, not all of us have C. diff all of the time, so this can't be the beginnings of some horrible epidemic. This has been going on this way probably for many, many, many uh, hundreds of years. So members of the Clostridium uh, family, just to give an idea of, uh, of uh, the company that this bacteria keeps, uh, there's some fairly notorious members of the family, including the uh, C. tetani, which is the cause of tetanus, and Clostridium perfringens, it's the cause of food poisoning and gas gangrene. So this is a pretty uh, nasty family to be part of. C. diff is a toxin-producing pathogen that causes diarrhea that can range from just mild diarrhea all the way up to life-threatening colitis that requires emergent surgery, intensive care stays, and can sometimes cause death. It's an anaerobic bacteria, that is to say that it doesn't tolerate oxygen very well. As it turns out, the environment in your intestines is actually quite low in oxygen, which is what lets it uh, survive there. However, C. diff can also survive oxygen by creating these durable things called spores. This leads on to our next question. What are spores? Spores are 
these bodies that are resistant to all sorts of harsh environmental conditions. Alcohol, like the alcohol that uh, you see in the hallways uh, uh, dispensed for the alcohol hand rubs. Oxygen, high and low temperatures, uh, harsh chemicals including disinfectants. I think of it a little bit uh, like an acorn, if that helps, in terms of something that's very, very tough and, uh, and can survive a lot, but still has the potential for uh, life within it. We know that spores can survive outdoors for long times. There's at least one study showing that uh, spores remain viable for at least four years in, uh, in an outdoor climate, and even on, uh, on indoors uh, for at least five months. So as you can see, that this uh, is going to cause some problems when you're trying to control uh, C. diff infections in large buildings like hospitals. The infectious dose of C. diff spores in humans, nobody really knows. There was an animal model that suggested that the infectious dose is quite low, maybe as little as 25 uh, spores, but this uh, is work that goes back about uh, 35 years. So who gets sick from C. diff? The main risk factor uh, for getting C. diff disease is recent exposure to antibiotics. Now the definition of recent is a little bit variable. Probably it's somewhere be uh, between at the present time to anywhere up to three months ago. Almost every single antibiotic that uh, I can name have been implicated at some point by, uh, in terms of causing C. diff. This includes pill antibiotics, this includes intravenous antibiotics. In general, those antibiotics that are broad spectrum, those that t uh, kill more different classes of bacteria, are probably worse offenders than those that are more narrow spectrum and more focused in the bacteria that they, uh, that they attack. There, there are other risk factors other than recent antibiotic exposure. Uh, increasing age seems to uh, be a risk factor. People who have inflammatory bowel disease are certainly more prone to getting uh, C. diff and getting uh, severe C. diff disease. And people who are on uh, chemotherapeutic agents. Now, just to make things more puzzling, some people can be colonized with C. diff, but remain completely asymptomatic, and you'd never know it was there if you didn't actually do a special test for it. So I mentioned colonization. Is this an important factor when it comes to spreading C. diff? And I'm borrowing a uh, graph from about uh, five years ago from uh, Riggs's uh, group that uh, you'll see uh, the top, I've got uh, uh, a and, uh, and B. So the top A looked at uh, the percentage of people who had detectable C. diff on their skin. Now remember your skin being exposed to oxygen. Uh, even though this bacteria can't handle oxygen, unfortunately its, its spores uh, very much can. So these are probably the spores that are living on, uh, on people's skin. So perhaps not too surprisingly, for patients who actually have C. diff disease, somewhere around 80% of them you could find somewhere on their skin. However, for people who had C. diff that you could detect in their intestines but were completely not sick from it, they also had very high levels of detectable C. diff on their skin, maybe around 60%. But in the hospital setting, even people who were neither sick from C. diff nor colonized, you could still find detectable C. diff in maybe about 15 to 20 percent of uh, people just on their skin. So again, this is probably because it's an environmental uh, bacteria. So if you have contact with soil, contact with, uh, with, uh, with the outside environment, you may have some just, just living on your skin. But this also speaks to the idea that even though we do the best we can to identify C. diff quickly, to put people into protective isolation quickly, that a lot of other patients in the hospital may be carriers of C. diff even if they're not sick from it. Another question I get asked a lot, especially every time that there's uh, headlines in the newspaper um, about C. diff is, is C. diff changing? Well, we first recognized C. diff as a cause of hospital-associated diarrhea back in the, in the late 1970s. We now know that it's actually the number one cause of diarrhea that's acquired uh, in hospitals or hospital-like settings. And as we'd uh, already mentioned during the, um, during the introduction, starting around 2003 or 2004, uh, we started seeing increasingly frequent uh, uh, disease from C. diff and increasingly severe disease from C. diff. So that leads to the question, well, if it is changing, why is it changing? There's a lot of culprits and a lot of uh, people uh, are spending um, their careers trying to sort out this very question. So one culprit that seems uh, certainly connected is there is at least 
uh, one well-known outbreak strain. Uh, also, uh, if you read all the literature, it's called about 600 different things, the NAP1 strain, the 027 strain. It's all the same thing. This was the bad strain that started running around our hospitals in large numbers starting around 2003. And this strain seems to have several virulence factors, that, that is to say characteristics that make it more prone to causing disease. For one thing, it's more resistant to some commonly used antibiotics, which might mean that those antibiotics used for other indications wouldn't be killing off this C. diff at the same time, sort of leaving the door open for uh, C. diff to cause problems. Also, this new strain seems to be able to make uh, greater amounts of toxins uh, than other strains of, uh, of C. diff. Not only can it make toxins more quickly, it also seems to be better at, at forming those resistant spores that we were talking about earlier. But it's not just as simple as that. Probably over time, our hospital population is changing. Overall, our patients are getting older, and not only are they getting older, which we already said was a risk factor for getting C. diff disease, they're also getting sicker. That is to say, people have more uh, different diseases that are interacting with each other and possibly making them more prone to getting certain infections, including C. diff. But uh, there's one other factor here, is that there may be um, a, changing in, a change in medical practices that increase use of antibiotics for medical as well as for non-medical indications, and in that I include uh, things like uh, in the agricultural uh, field. Those practices may also be uh, connected to this increased problem we're seeing with C. diff. So how do you get infected with C. diff? This is a quite a nice picture that I got from uh, a colleague in Toronto from uh, published a few years ago. And so what happens is from either uh, the food that is ingested or more likely from contaminated, uh, from, uh, contaminated hands that have touched either uh, contaminated skin like we talked about earlier or some other contaminated surface, you ingest a mishmash of live bacteria and spores. A lot of the live bacteria are probably killed by the acidity in the stomach if they even survive that far, but the spores that are very resistant can certainly handle the acid environment in the stomach. They then get down to the small intestine where those spores germinate and, and basically hatch into the live uh, bacteria and then uh, they start to attack the intestine, particularly when they arrive in the large intestine. Um, they stick to the walls, as it were, to the, sides of the, um, to the sides of the intestine. They multiply and they produce these toxins that uh, damage the intestinal uh, lining and that's what really makes people sick. So how do you know if you have C. diff? So if you, if you start to develop problems that include uh, diarrhea, particularly after you started antibiotics for any indication, this includes things like going on, uh, going on antibiotics when you go to the dentist, for example. Um, if you develop fever, if you have a lot of pain in the abdomen, then this is certainly a warning sign that it's time to go see, uh, see a physician. Your physician will want to get a history of those symptoms like we just talked about. Your physician will want to find out if you were recently exposed to antibiotics because if you were, then that certainly increases the chances really of C. diff. If you weren't exposed to antibiotics at all, then there may be something else going on that uh, needs further investigation. The physician will certainly want to do a physical exam, including things like taking your temperature, checking your pulse, examining your abdomen very well. There's uh, stool tests uh, that can be done to detect either the bacteria itself or the, t the damaging toxins uh, that it makes. And there may be other testing, such as blood tests or x-rays that the doctor may want to order. So how can you prevent C. diff? Now, this question can take many forms, whether you're asking this to sort of uh, a person in the community, to a patient in the hospital, to uh, someone who works in the hospital. Um, what I would suggest is if you can, avoid taking unnecessary antibiotics. And I have to explain that, okay? There is certainly a role here both for physicians and patients. For physicians, certainly there are cases where they probably prescribe too many antibiotics for indications that really don't warrant that. There are also certainly cases where patients really demand being given an antibiotic uh, despite the doctor's reluctance. And there's a role for both parties here to uh, scale it down, if you will. What I'd strongly advise you, though, is do not just stop your antibiotic and don't tell anyone. You presumably got that antibiotic from a doctor who is giving it to you for some reason. So what I would strongly recommend you do is uh, to uh, first discuss it with that physician and say, listen, I'm worried that I might have C. diff. What should I do? 
Now, if you have risk factors for C. difficile, like we already talked about, age, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, if you're on chemotherapy, etc., uh, you should probably avoid contact with people who have proven C. diff or who are suspected to have uh, C. diff. If you do have such contact, I'd certainly suggest that you wash your hands very well. And without going into a whole diatribe just on that, what I would suggest is because those spores are resistant to alcohol, that you're probably better off washing your hands with soap and water rather than those alcohol-based rubs. Now, how can you treat C. difficile? If it's possible, one of the mainstays of treatment is to stop the uh, inciting antibiotic. Again, only do that in, conjunct in conjunction with your physician, talk it out with them and decide what the best course of action is. Uh, if you have uh, only mild uh, or to sort of moderate severity uh, C. diff, then there's one antibiotic that can be used that uh, is effective against C. diff called flagellar metronidazole. For more severe cases, um, and for most cases here in the hospital, we use a different medication called vancomycin. There are other medications that, again, I'm not going to go through it uh, tonight, but there are several other medications, but these are certainly the two best known and the most uh, well-established uh, treatments for C. diff. There are other non-medication-based treatments that we can use for severe cases, which include intravenous injections of antibodies, intravenous immunoglobulins, uh, and in some cases you even need to do surgery where you remove part or all of the uh, infected intestine. Can you become immune to C. diff? I get this question a lot. So at present, you, if you look at all people who get C. diff disease, about 70 to 80 percent of them seem to only develop a single episode and that's it. In that group, a lot of people seem to mount good immune responses to those toxins that I talked about that damage your intestine. So in a way, those toxins actually, uh, in those people, vaccinate them against uh, those toxins and protect them, that, that seems to protect them from getting further disease. As a result of this finding, people are now working on developing vaccines for, uh, for C. difficile that are in various phases of testing. Unfortunately, as I said, that's 70 to 80 percent of uh, people. The other 20 to 30 percent of people do have one or more recurrent episodes of disease. Why do some people get recurrent C. diff? So, as I mentioned, it lives in two forms, the vegetative, the active bacteria form, and the spore or inactive form in the gut. Those antibiotics that I just told you about that we use to treat C. diff, the metronidazole and the vancomycin, they only are effective against the live form, against the vegetative form. Spores that are in the intestine don't get affected, they just stay in the intestine and they can later hatch into vegetative forms. That's actually partly why you treat C. difficile for a fairly long time, is you want to give all the spores that are there enough time to hatch into those live bacteria, and as long as your treatment is still going on, those live bacteria will then be taken care of by the treatment. But if spores remain after your course of treatment is finished, they can then hatch and go on to causing recurrence of disease. And the other sort of side of what I told you one slide ago is that some people's immune systems seem to be incapable of reacting to C. diff toxins. In other words, they never become immune to C. diff's effects, and they can go on to have multiple recurrences. And I've seen patients who literally cannot go off of any of these medicines because every time they do, they have another episode of C. diff. And you can probably imagine that having perpetual diarrhea for a year or longer is not a very pleasant way to continue. So what can you do for those uh, nasty recurrent cases of C. diff? Well, you start often by trying prolonged courses of treatment with metronidazole or vancomycin for exactly the reason I said, that what you're trying to do is give all the spores in the person's body enough time to hatch so that you don't stop the treatment until all the spores are gone. Now, the other side of things is sometimes people who you know have had C. diff need antibiotics for some other reason. They have a pneumonia, for example. So what you can do in those cases is you have to give them the antibiotic, you're going to give them for the pneumonia, but at the same time, you start them on treatment for C. diff even before they've developed any problems from C. diff. Because if that treatment is there up front, you stop the C. diff from ever kind of uh, flaring up again. And one thing that people uh, often ask about and has a very high yik factor, for which I'm sure you're probably quite glad I don't have color photographs, is you can actually do what are called stool transplants. And in fact, we are doing those here in this hospital, although these, uh, keep in mind, these are not things that are done commonly, but there are a few hospitals around, ours included, uh, that uh, do this treatment for people who have 
horrible, frequently recurrent uh, disease. What happens is you get stool donated by usually a healthy uh, member of the same household. The reason for that is actually really interesting, and we're going to touch more on this when I talk about probiotics a little bit later. But essentially, if you live in the same house, you eat more or less the same food, you live under the same conditions, the, all the different bacteria that live in your intestine are probably fairly similar to the bacteria that live in the, other, in the intestines of the other people in the household. So if you want to give people back good, healthy bacteria, the best bacteria you can give them is the ones that seem to do well in their intestines, which are, how do I say that? Uh, probably the, the, the best source of those bacteria that are going to do well in that person's intestines are the bacteria in the intestines of other people in the same conditions who live in that same household. So what, what we do is we get uh, a motivated family member to donate some stool. We do a bunch of tests to make sure that there's no infectious diseases in the stool already, obviously. Uh, we apply uh, the stool to the intestines. Here we actually pass a tube down through the nose, through the stomach, and into the small intestine. Uh, there's another way of doing it where you actually apply it by colonoscopy. A really smart British group of microbiologists sidestepped the whole yik factor by making in their lab a soup of about 10 different kinds of bacteria. They just grew it up in the lab and basically turned it into a soup and got people to drink it. And that also seemed to work. And hey, at least you get around some of the gross factor. But here's the thing. These are people who have had horrible recurrent disease for weeks, months, and I'm not kidding you, sometimes years. They are not happy people. They are miserable people. And believe me, after a certain amount of time, you're willing to do anything to get rid of this. So not only are you willing to do anything, which provides the motivation for doing this, it works. The cure rate, when we have studied this in limited series, this is not a very widespread treatment for reasons you can probably imagine why, but when we do this, the cure rate is somewhere around 80 to 90 percent for people who have failed every single other treatment. So this is not small potatoes here. You know, we do have work, uh, work to be done to try to make it obviously easier uh, and uh, more palatable for people to do, but it really does seem to be an effective treatment for those cases where nothing else works. So moving on to the next uh, topic, a logical segue, is probiotics. I was very pleased when I found this cartoon. So let's start with a very simple question. What are probiotics? So this comes from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Back in 2001, they came up with a definition that pretty much uh, uh, all the major organizations and governments subscribe to now, which is that of live microorganisms which, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. There are a huge variety of probiotic species out there. There's uh, Saccharomyces boulardii, there's Lactobacillus rhamnosus, there's Lactobacillus uh, acidophilus. There are piles of them. One of the problems is it doesn't take a lot for you to call almost anything you want a probiotic. Uh, there's also a huge variability in how these different bacteria and sometimes fungi are produced, how often you take them, whether they're sort of single or whether they come in, uh, in combinations with, uh, with the various species. So people ask me this all the time, are probiotics good for your health? This question has been studied a lot. The problem is most of the studies that have been done have been relatively small. By that I mean not a lot of people have been enrolled, which means that the information you get from them you have to interpret pretty carefully because it doesn't take much to imagine that if you have a small group of 25 people, just by fluke you might see one thing or another, but it's a different thing when you're talking about a group of 2,500 people. Okay. So in one meta-analysis, that is to say it was a study of studies where they looked at the accumulated data after 25 of these relatively small trials, okay, a uh, gastroenterologist found that overall probiotics seemed to reduce risk of, in this case it generally had to do with diarrhea, by around 57%. But it wasn't as simple as that because only one study out of seven that showed any effect whatsoever actually involved any population of adults. The rest were all done in kids. So believe it or not, despite all the stuff you see in advertisements on the, on the television and whatnot about probiotics, despite the things you're going to read on the labels, we don't have a huge amount of proof that probiotics uh, are, uh, can produce a strong benefit to your health. And 
Canada does have a few food substances. At the last time I checked, uh, w there was about 10 food substances that were approved to be called probiotics because they had something that was backed up by some evidence. But this is done by Health Canada, and I'll point out that their standard of proof when it comes to probiotics is very, very low. So what they consider proof and what I consider proof are not necessarily the same thing. However, if you look at what's happening in the States and what's happening in Europe, at the present moment, neither the FDA in the States nor the European Food Safety Agency have any products that have been approved for making health claims uh, because they are probiotics. So that should tell you that at the very least a lot more studying needs to be done or, if you take a more skeptical view, that even with more studying there may not be very strong effects from these. So where can you find probiotics? The most common uh, sources include live culture and fermented foods. This can be yogurts, uh, this can be uh, sauerkrauts. Surprisingly enough, despite the uh, flourishing uh, microbrewery culture here in uh, Quebec, there are certainly some beers that are still fermenting when you open them, and yet no one has yet uh, thought to market them as probiotic beer. So you heard it here tonight. If you see this on the shelves this summer, you know where the idea came from. You can certainly purchase probiotics in drugstores. They have piles of brands. They're very happy to sell them to you. They have some that are in their fridge, some that are kept at room temperature. These, one of the ways that they sidestep a lot of the uh, regulatory requirements is not by calling them health benefits, but calling them nutritional supplements, where they're, they're, the legislation around them is a lot looser. You can certainly find probiotics in your intestines, like I was talking about those stool transplants for C. diff. You ask me, the best probiotic for you are the bacteria that are already living in your intestine. So I think eventually what we're going to be able to do is take a quote-unquote snapshot of the bacteria that are in your intestine, and if we have to give you antibiotics for some reason that might put you at risk of C. diff, we will know exactly what bacteria we need to put back into you that might be different from you that might be different from you. And honestly, probably most of us have got probiotics in our fridge already and just don't know it. Are probiotics always safe? I would caution you that you do not assume that natural equals safe. Remember I mentioned uh, some of the nastier members of the Clostridium family earlier. Clostridium botulinum is another example. That's the causative agent of botulism. Botulism toxin is perfectly natural. It certainly is not safe. In general, probiotics do not appear to cause significant harm. So what I would suggest is I would call them adjunctive therapy, which is you might add them on top of other things. So if you're going to go on antibiotics for some indication, uh, some infection, you might want, you could consider using probiotics because they may help reduce uh, the risk of getting C. diff or the risk of getting other kinds of diarrhea connected with those antibiotics. But I really would strongly recommend that you don't consider them to be replacements for other pr more proven therapies. And I will also point out to you that there is certainly a risk for fungemia, that is to say infection in the blood from fungi. I've seen this myself actually. And this was in an ICU patient uh, who was in bed A, and he developed a blood infection from Saccharomyces boulardii, which is one of those probiotics I mentioned a few slides back. Not because he was on them, but because the patient in bed B was being given Saccharomyces boulardii to prevent C. diff. And in fact, patient in bed B was probably covered with Saccharomyces and then someone transmitted it over to the patient in bed A who actually got sick from it. So what I'd boil that down to say is that you don't, um, they're not completely harmless. You know, it certainly you have to have a whole bunch of risk factors. I'm talking about people in the ICU who have central venous catheters, you know, intravenous lines in their neck, who have obviously multiple other health problems and whatnot, but they're not without their own set of uh, potential risks. Do probiotics help with C. diff? I can't really say it better than actually a statistician with whom I've worked previously, who's right here at uh, McGill, uh, said it in her analysis back in 2005, that the studies conducted to date provide insufficient evidence for the routine clinical use of probiotics to prevent or treat C. Uh, C. difficile associated disease. Better designed and larger studies are needed. And uh, the Cochrane database, which is this huge database that looks at those meta-analyses, those studies of studies, to try to figure out if you can put together 30, 40, 50 small studies and arrive at one larger 
uh, database that might give you some answers. They also said a few years later, unfortunately, these small studies do not provide enough evidence to support the use of probiotics for treating C. diff infection. So now on to the autism gut connection. So what is autism? So this is, uh, this is a topic that's probably more appropriate for a pediatric hospital than for an adult uh, hospital, but I f uh, this is something that's come out relatively recently. I find it really, really interesting. Um, there's also, I also have a personal uh, family connection uh, to this, which is part of what makes me pay attention to these uh, kinds of topics. So I'm going to spend a few slides talking about this. What is autism? Autism is an information processing disorder characterized by impaired social interaction, difficulties in communication, restricted interests, and repetitive behaviors usually starts before the age of three. There's been a recent quote-unquote epidemic of autism. There's been a fair number of headlines about it in the last couple of years where um, at the present time, well up until recently, it was uh, felt that about one in a hundred children who are now born uh, will be placed somewhere on the autism spectrum and there's been even more recent data that those uh, numbers might be even lower, might be as, as high as 1 in 88. We're talking about more than 1% of all children who are born. This is probably due to a bunch of different factors. There's certainly increased awareness. We know a lot more now about what autism is than we did 30 or 40 years ago where a lot of times it was misdiagnosed. Uh, we, cer we certainly are doing more uh, testing for it uh, than we ever were able to do before. There is certainly a connection that as parents are on average getting older before they have their children, older parents seem to be more prone to having children who, have, uh, who are on the autism spectrum. And there may be a role for some environmental exposures. So do children with ASD have intestinal problems? Intestinal symptoms are certainly not part of the official disease definition for autism. However, there have been numerous descriptions and studies showing that children with an autism spectrum disorder do have intestinal symptoms. This is usually in the lines of diarrhea, cramps, and sometimes malabsorption. So is there some sort of a causal link between autism spectrum uh, disorder and intestinal problems? At the present moment, it's not clear whether there is a causal link, and if there is, in which direction. Does ASD lead to dysfunction in the gut? Or does gut dysfunction lead to ASD? To try to sort out this question, this led to studies that looked at the different kinds of bacteria that live in the intestines of children with ASD, as well as children who are neurotypical, that is, children who don't have uh, ASD. Now, I'll point out to you that doing these kinds of studies is really difficult. Think for a moment about the task that would be before you if you had to go and enumerate all the different kinds of animal species in a rainforest. Okay? It's easy to spot the ones that are brightly colored. It's easy to see the ones where there are a lot of them running around. It's easy to see the ones that are out there in broad daylight. It's a lot harder to find the ones that are rare, the ones that are well hidden, the ones that, are on, that only come out at certain uh, times of the day. And when you're talking about trying to really identify all the different kinds of bacteria in people's intestines, this was kind of the task uh, before them. Nonetheless, they managed to find a way to sort of assess the dominant populations of bacteria in the gut of children with autism spectrum disorders as well as the guts of children uh, who weren't uh, similarly affected. And this goes back to about 10 years ago where probably the first major study to this was, uh, was Feingold, Feingold and co-workers where they compared a group of 13 kids who had a specific kind of autism called late onset or regressive autism versus eight healthy children. And what they found was that in the healthy children they didn't find uh, certain groups of bacteria uh, that they did find in, the ch in, uh, in children with, uh, with autism. They then went on, uh, another group went on a few years later to try to sort this out and figure out which were the bacteria uh, more specifically. And what they identified was, and I'm coming back to my friend Clostridium here, only this time this is a different member of the family called Clostridium histolyticum. What they found is the fecal flora of ASD patients had a higher concentration of Clostridium histolyticum than those of healthy children. And if you looked at the siblings of children who had autism, okay, and these siblings themselves didn't have autism, but obviously they live in the same house, eat the same food and whatnot, those children had an intermediate amount of this, uh, of this particular group of bacteria. So why does this get interesting? Why might these bacteria be connected to autism? These bacteria, like a lot of, uh, like all anaerobic uh, organisms, 
need to get energy. They do that by fermenting carbohydrates. They wind up producing as a byproduct of this fermentation um, chemicals that are called short chain fatty acids. Some of these fermentation products, the theory is, may trick our neurons by acting as neurotransmitters. That is to say, chemical signals that our, the neurons in our brain and our central nervous system use to communicate with each other. So there's a group at the University of Western Ontario uh, that uh, has been doing a lot of work in this field. And if you watch um, um, David Suzuki's The Nature of Things, about three or four months ago, he had uh, a whole hour on this. And it's fascinating stuff. So what this group identified was one chemical called propionic acid, one of these short chain fatty acids that might be acting as a neurotransmitter. Uh, and what they, what they did then, after they identified that as a culprit, is they took pure propionic acid and injected it into healthy rats. Rats are relatively social animals, okay? The results of doing this experiment were striking. Those animals that got injected with propionic acid started acting like they had autism. They stopped being social. They started doing some of the repetitive movements that we see uh, uh, similarly in children who have autism. This is by no means saying that this is the smoking gun, but this is really interesting work that I think is going to lead to a lot more interesting findings down the line. Where could this lead? Amongst other things, if you could at least detect high concentrations of these suspect bacteria in children at risk, that could give you an early warning sign that maybe this child could go on to develop autism. You could also look for those fermentation products, those short chain fatty acids, by doing tests of stool, of urine, of blood. Because right now, let me tell you, diagnosing autism is something that is very complicated and difficult to do. And anything we could do to make that diagnosis more accurate and faster and easier would certainly be, uh, would uh, lead to faster recognition, faster interventions for those affected children, and probably better outcomes, because we do know that children who get treated earlier tend to do better. But not only could it lead to better diagnosis, this could lead to better treatment. If you used antibiotics in these children, could you eradicate those nasty bacterial species? However, uh, even uh, uh, more holistically, I suppose, could you alter their intestinal flora to, prom to discourage growth of those bad bacteria and promote growth of more protective bacteria? So this is where that kind of work is leading to. And hopefully, I'll be able to stand up here in front of you in a few years' time and uh, give you a lot more information on that. Now on to uh, the last of our four topics for tonight, listeria. You've probably heard something about this in the news in the last few days. In fact, if you lived in Quebec, you've probably heard uh, things about listeria on and off uh, for the last several months. So what is listeria monocytogenes? It's a bacteria that causes disease, sometimes just sporadically on sort of a random uh, basis, but certainly sometimes in epidemic form. It's a foodborne illness. I mean, there's, there are several like it. Uh, however, if you look at all foodborne illnesses, listeria uh, has a disproportionate number of deaths relative to the number of uh, uh, episodes of sickness that it causes. It's also a very smart pathogen that actually protects itself from your immune system by invading and living within cells. I'll get, I'll get to, to that more in a moment. So where is listeria found? Just like C. diff that I told you about earlier, this is also an environmental isolate. You can find it in soil. You can find it in sewage. One neat thing about listeria is that it tolerates cold temperatures very well. One of the reasons we use fridges is to preserve food. You put food with a mix of listeria and other bacteria in the fridge. The other bacteria will replicate very slowly, if at all. Listeria loves it. Couldn't care less about the fact that it's in the fridge. Listeria will keep on replicating. Now, uh, uh, had uh, generated with the last week are that picture of the salad bag on the left. Uh, this is actually a product that's not sold in Quebec, uh, but is actually sold throughout the rest of Canada. It's uh, the, the, the pre-bagged salad. Um, but every single picture I'm showing you here is related to a food recall because of listeria that's happened here in Canada within the last six months. Okay? This is something that happens on a fairly regular basis, unfortunately. What kinds of diseases does listeria cause? Uh, 
the most common by far is febrile gastroenteritis. Now those are, um, I, I've so far been trying to keep the $5 uh, medical terminology word out of this talk, but uh, I slipped up there. So febrile gastroenteritis, febrile just means with a fever, gastroenteritis means some sort of inflammation of the stomach or the intestinal lining, okay? Now, now, although that's probably the most common infection, as a doctor, the infections uh, that Listeria can cause that scare me are the other ones, which are called the invasive ones. It can cause septicemia, that is to say sort of a big infection of the bloodstream. It can cause infections of the, of the brain, of the cerebral spinal fluid, uh, which can be meningitis or encephalitis. It can also uh, lead to a high rate of spontaneous abortions in pregnant women. How does listeria make you sick? It produces adhesins, which are molecules that help it attach to its target cells in the intestine. So just like that picture I showed you with C. diff, again, you ingest the listeria uh, by eating some sort of contaminated food. It goes down your stomach. It doesn't like very acidic environments, but it can handle modestly acidic environments for a little while, so it survives the stomach, and then it lands into the small intestine. It attaches to some of the, the lining cells of the small intestine. And once, it, once it, it's a, attached, as compared to C. diff that starts producing toxins that damage the intestinal lining, this one actually invades the cells directly. It goes into the intestinal lining cells and even some of the, uh, the macrophages, which are one of the group of white blood cells that make up part of your immune system. So by surviving within these cells, it protects itself. Now, if you think about it, that's a fairly bright survival strategy. If you were, let's say, a protester, and you were being chased by the immune system cops, if you're going to be running around the street, you're, you're visible. It's very easy for the cops to pick you up. But if you were to dodge into someone's house, which would be sort of the innocent bystanding cell, that would be one way of certainly avoiding arrest, or the smartest way of all is you dodge into a police car, and all of a sudden, none of the other police cars are going to suspect that you are a bad guy. I don't know why that particular example came to mind. <laughs> after, and then after it invades these cells, then it has free range. It can then travel via the blood to all sorts of other target organs. And as I mentioned with the meningitis with encephalitis, listeria for some reason has a particular uh, preference for going to the brain. So who's at risk for listeria? Uh, so the risk factors for people to get that invasive listeria disease, uh, age, newborns generally in up to about uh, two months of age, and people who are probably old, like 50 to 60 years and up from there. People who are immunocompromised, certainly people who have HIV and AIDS, people who are organ transplant recipients who are on immunosuppressive medications, uh, pregnant women because as you can imagine, when you're uh, a woman who's pregnant has, you could look at it this way, a tissue graft inside of herself that is 50% made of cells that are not her. Her immune system has to be kind of dampened down in order to tolerate that 50% of uh, cells that aren't her normal sort of uh, uh, cells that her immune system is used to. But in the process of dampening down that immune system, it also means that that the pregnant woman becomes prone to certain infections and listeria is one of them. Even diabetes and uh, other diseases, uh, chronic disease of the kidney and liver can pe put people at risk for getting invasive disease from listeria. So how do you diagnose uh, listeria? Uh, I mean, I mentioned some of the typical symptoms like the sort of the, the fever with the intestinal infection uh, which would lead to things like abdominal pain and diarrhea. Uh, you know, certainly if I saw a patient in front of me, I'd be wanting to know what sorts of exposures could they have had that might have put them at risk, and we'll go through some of those uh, in a moment. Um, physical exam, you want to look for things like fever, you want to look for signs of meningitis, intestinal illness. Certainly if, uh, if you have a woman of childbearing age, you want to know if they are pregnant, and if so, if, uh, if the fetus seems to be healthy or not. Uh, this can be a difficult infection to diagnose in the laboratory. You can sometimes do it from stool culture, although sometimes that takes so many days that by the time you get the answer, the information basically is too late to be of much use. You can sometimes detect it in blood cultures. And again, depending on where you think the infection has gone to, for example, if it's causing a meningitis, you can do a spinal tap where you take some of the fluid um, in the spinal canal and uh, analyze that. 
So how can you prevent listeria? I mentioned about some of the high risk exposures. So I showed you those pictures there, things that are raw, so raw fruits and vegetables like the, the salad bag that I showed you about, um, uh, uncooked, uh, uncooked uh, meats or undercooked meats, uh, unpasteurized milk and products made from unpasteurized milk, so I regret to say that here in this province, but raw cheeses uh, are certainly one of the possible risk factors. So if you are at risk for getting invasive disease from listeria, you're probably best off to avoid exposure to those kinds of high-risk foods. Okay? If you are going to eat those foods, I'd suggest you only eat them if they've been well cooked. So for example, with cold cuts, what you can do there is you actually can toss them in the frying pan until they're, until they're nice and hot, and then you can let them cool off, but you know you've at least killed any listeria uh, uh, that is there. And obviously, if they're, you know, pay attention to recalls, and if there are recalls for food that you might have, you should probably chuck those things in the garbage. So how can you treat listeria? So usually for the most common infection, that febrile gastroenteritis I mentioned, usually don't need to treat. The body will look after itself in good time. Only rarely do you need to give antibiotics, and in that case we have the options of a few different kinds of pill antibiotics uh, that can be used usually for people who have some risk factors. But it's the invasive disease you have to treat, and you have to treat pretty aggressively, usually with intravenous antibiotics, and, and usually for something excuse me, in the order of uh, two to three weeks or possibly longer. The duration depends on the kind of disease, as well as obviously the status of the person's immune system. The sicker that they are, the weaker their immune system is, probably the longer you're going to have to treat them. So that takes me to the, I guess, the closing comments for, the, uh, for our talk tonight on bugs in the gut. So what I'd like to tell you is that uh, our guts are more than just organs, they're entire ecosystems. Understanding how these ecosystems get disrupted by disease might help us better understand how to diagnose disease, how to treat uh, disease, and how to keep people in good health. And whenever you encounter any intestinal infection, if in doubt, wash your hands. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.